The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to a new microphone edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. You know, it's interesting, Jonah, uh, talking to my usual co-host, Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times. Jonah, I have had no fewer than, I don't know, 10, 12 people ask me when the new microphone is, is being introduced. They have their theories. Uh, they're not necessarily, um, uh, the last episode actually came out clean which will go down in history as the last episode with the previous questionable microphone. I think maybe the microphone knew it, like maybe when you're taking your car in and all of a sudden it just starts acting good for you to make sure you don't take it to the junkyard or trade it in. Um, but Jonah, I've had people, they're curious about the microphone. And uh, by this point in my monologue, they now will probably have an opinion as to whether or not the microphone will suffice. Well, I can hear you loud and clear. Maybe that microphone was just sick and needed a couple of weeks on the mend and was on its way back. It is sitting over here on its side as though it's ready to die. I mean, even looking at it from a, a literal sense, it's very symbolic. A cord that leads nowhere. Uh, the, uh, the spit guard. Uh, the screen that uh, you put on top of it is askew, uh, probably similar to Lincoln's stovepipe hat, uh, the night at Ford's Theater, uh, just does not look good. Um, but it was functional in its last performance, and I wish it, uh, I, I rest in peace to that microphone. This new microphone looks totally different. Same, uh, it was sent to me by The Athletic, very kind of them to do that but it's the same make and model and it doesn't look anything similar. So that's throwing me a little bit, but I'm guessing that I can only assume, and I won't know for sure until uh, we end the recording and I go into the production process that this microphone sounds a lot better. Jonah, I know you're happy for me and I know you're happy for us. You spent some time out at KeyBank Center today for the Don Granado, Kevin Adams post-mortem news conference. It's when everybody reflects on the past season and talks about their needs uh, heading into the offseason, the draft, free agency, all that good stuff. So, uh, Joan, I guess uh, just let, let's start with that. Uh, the Sabres, even though we're coming off of an NFL draft weekend and, and we're going to get to the Bills picks. Uh, I think we're going to talk some stadium also, which we didn't do last week, but um, we'll, we'll get to a lot of different things here today. Uh, but the Sabres still have a hold uh, on this on this market, on the fan base, uh, despite the NFL and its and its mighty industry and the NFL being its or the NFL draft, I should say, almost being like the the fifth North American sport, uh, major league sport. Probably would rank third over all the things that were happening this week maybe maybe the maybe and i'm saying the nba playoffs and the nhl playoffs would would eclipse that but i don't know i don't i don't think so but let's talk sabers what'd you learn today well you called it a post-mortem which is often what these events are described as but i, I don't think you could accurately use that term for what this press conference with Don Granado and Kevin Adams was like today and the locker clean out that I didn't attend myself or watch some videos and was aware of it was a it's been a happy occasion it's been a almost like the last week of school where the kids don't want school to end or they don't want camp to end and everybody still wishes this season was going on and a lot of I wouldn't call it celebratory but there was a lot of smiling happy faces and almost pride in how well the team played and finished the season and the development in all of the positive trend lines and trajectory of where the franchise is going. 
which contrasts with the record and really where they are on paper and statistically. And, and when you look at the Saber season from an objective standpoint, but if you were there for as many games as I was, or you probably as many games as you were, you only had to really be in the building for a couple key victories that they had in the big occasions, uh, whether it was Rick Jenneret's last call or the game where they put his banner up or the Dean Jack Eichel return, but it was a season of good vibes. And that really carried over into this final press conference and will carry over into the off season. And the vibes at least will carry over into next season. We'll see what happens on the ice, but the vibes are here to stay at least for a while. Yeah. It's interesting. A team that doesn't make the playoffs, uh, even a team that does make the playoffs. So they've had more success based on record, maybe even win around. Let's say you yeah. lose in the second round and generally uh, the mood at these uh, post-mortem uh, these, these uh, uh, these autopsies, uh, the mood is so somber because they just uh, suffered a crushing loss. Uh, they had high hopes. Um, and so you get a lot of depressed talk. Uh, maybe a couple days later, you might get something a little more philosophical from, say, uh, a captain who's been around a long time or the head coach. You know, somebody like a Lindy Ruff at the time when who, who'd coached for a long time, who played for a long time. Um, and that's after far more success. So they they experienced uh, less uh, victory on the ice, but they're happier probably because the expectations were dialed back so much. The expectations over the years have been so terrible. Um, now, let me take that back. The expectations weren't always terrible. The expectations were, hell, as soon as we tank for Jack Eichel, I, I there was a large sentiment in this town anyway, as soon as we tank for Jack Eichel, it's playoffs. Maybe not the next year, but for sure, we're challenging for Stanley Cups within two years. And of course that didn't happen. So the expectations probably isn't a word I should use, but what we've gotten used to in Western New York for is just such misery uh, for those teams. So this strikes a different pose, a starkly different uh, posture for an organization that heading into the season, and I'm going to keep saying it because it's me falling on my sword over and over again. I, I said that if this works out, uh, from a managerial standpoint, it will have been a miracle. Uh, Don Granado was on the staff all along. Uh, Ralph Kruger had brought them to new depths. Uh, Kevin Adams with his zero NHL general manager experience and operating with a smaller staff than uh, his predecessors did. And somehow they've created excitement. Uh, and so I'm not, I'm not ridiculing the feel. I'm just kind of marveling uh, at, um, at what it would take to get to that point and the, the, the triumph of spirit, I guess, within this organization. Um, but what, how you mentioned it, Jonah, the vibes lasting a while. Uh, and I know it's hard to say, but as two guys who've covered sports for a long, long time and been in these locker rooms and covered championship teams and, and, and doormats, what do you think the next step is in terms of uh, building or using this? What must they do to channel this spirit into something for next season or even uh, in how they operate over the summer in terms of uh, roster building? Well, I don't know if they're really going to use this season as a springboard to try to get much better for next season. I, I don't think, the Sabres need to spend some money to get up to the salary cap floor and the will make some free agent signings, but I don't think they're looking to make big splashes in this free agent summer. And that might be a year away or whether it be trades, they do have three picks in the draft, but they're probably going to be three rookie players that don't play in Buffalo right away. You would assume maybe they trade a pick for a player. I think that the positioning the roster to win now and go for it and be a playoff team is maybe a year or two away at least that's where it seems. Maybe there's an opportunity that presents itself. I don't think they're going to sign Taylor Hall, for example, like they did two summers ago, two, three summers ago, whenever that was. Um, but I think in the long term, it's going to be harder to build a team from where they are than it was. As much as it seems like a miracle that they turn the culture around and everything seems to be going in the right direction. Um, right. They're still not a playoff team. Yeah, you can screw that up, but that's a little bit easier to do. It's easier to go from being at the bottom of the league to now they're kind of, if you break, they're 24th. So they're in now that 
third quartile of the league, which is still a bad team. But you're right, Jonah. Not and I just to, to emphasize that point, you're right. I, and I and myself included at my my soliloquy there. And I think some fans, as we talk to them, um, whether it be on social media, at the bar, whatever, you run into them, you know, out in public. And they do want to talk about the team as though they just won the first round, you know, in five games. Yeah. Well, uh, right. that, that, so yeah. we do need we do need to yeah. dial that back and say that yeah, you're right. The they were they came from such depths, from such an abyss that they're now somewhat they're competitive, they're, especially towards the, the end of the season. They're because we're factoring in the record at the beginning of the season too. But so they're competitive, but they're still they still seem several pieces away from being a consistent enough team to be, be known as a playoff contender. Right. Well, and so they were, their record over the last 28 games, their point percentage was 13th in the league. So they, if it was only a 28 game season to make the playoffs, they might've made the playoffs or if you could extrapolate the way they played the last two months. Right. But if that was a full season, if somehow you could bottle that and spread it out over a full season, this past season or next season, then they're a playoff team or a playoff contending yeah. team. Um, but it, it, it's interesting to me because kind of looking at where they finished. Now that takes the, they started hot. Then they had injuries and illnesses and a, a kind of a slump for a couple of months going through the Jack Eichel trade. Alex Tuck wasn't ready to play, wasn't healthy to play right away. When Tuck and Krebs got into the lineup, that's really when the start of that turnaround happened and it kicked into higher gear with some of those big wins against Vegas and the heritage classic and things like that towards the end of the season, but where they finished record wise points, percentage wise, four, five, one, you know, that's lower than either of the seasons, Dan Bilesma coached, and it's lower than Ralph Kruger's first year. And that season was a little different. The trajectory, they didn't finish as strong as they started like this team did, but there were some of the same talks about turning around the culture and, that things are finally going in the right direction and they have the right coach. It's kind of amazing the way it went in year two with Ralph Kruger. And to think back that a lot of people thought that was a good move, that they had found a guy who not only could be the coach, but maybe he'd move up and be the president of hockey. It was like Ralph Kruger was the face of the franchise for a small moment in time until all of a sudden he became the face of everything that was wrong with the franchise. And that face has changed a number of times over the years, whether it's Dicey Regeer or, Jason Bottrell or Phil Housley or Jack Eichel at times. It was always like, got to get this guy out of here and nothing will change until we do that. It does seem like maybe the Sabres have done that. Maybe they have finally purged that losing culture and the dark cloud and whatever that curse of the tank, if, if that's a thing or if something was happening with the way they went about trying to build the team before. But if you just look at how old they are, average age, things like that, they're older than they were in that first season with Jack Eichel. That was also Sam Reinhardt's rookie year. There was another team with a lot of young players and first round draft picks. And they were on the up and up. As you said, it was the fans were like, we're making the playoffs as soon as possible with that group. This team is a bit older than that and performed a bit worse than that. But there is a belief that they're going in the right direction. I think it's because a lot of young players took steps and the vibes and the culture. And Don Granato is a likable person, both in his own locker room with his players and the franchise, but also with the fan base. They say all the right things. Um, you know, it's a little thing, but Don Granato and Kevin Adams were both really went out of their way to thank the media for their coverage this past season. And we don't need that. We don't need to be thanked. But just the fact that they were that appreciative is a striking contrast to general managers and team presidents in the past and the way some of these final meetings have gone. That's um, from the Derek Boyko School of Public Relations. Derek sure. Boyko, who's right. in charge of the Bills, he has Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott do that, actually walk off the podium and shake hands. Thank oh, you. We we Thank you. That, but. Um, well, but maybe we, maybe that was a little too uh, too uncomfortable for uh, for the staid uh, NHL. Sure, well, and COVID protocols. Maybe that was why. But uh, with Darcy Regeer, would he have ever come up and thanked you for your coverage in that final news conference? But often that's testy. I think that was a big difference today too. There's no questions about whether the GM is going to still be the GM anymore, whether the coach is coming back, or whether they are going to re-sign these star players or if it's time to trade Ryan Miller, Thomas Vanek, things like that, that hung over these final press conferences. And all it those, also wasn't. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just going to say all those questions too, that come with that edge of, can't you finally admit the tank didn't work? And I'm not saying that it did or didn't, but there've been, those questions have always existed and they were going to keep existing until Jack Eichel is no longer on the team. 
So now that Jack Eichel has been traded, all of that is kind of evaporated from a media standpoint. And there are, you know, certain reporters who like to hammer that more than others. Uh, I'm not going to name names, uh, which is unlike me, but, uh, but that is gone. That edge of can't please, please admit that you, that you fuck this up or admit that you keep stepping on rakes or whatever that, that confrontational uh, form of questioning doesn't exist anymore. It creates a healthier environment. Right. Cause there, at least in the past 12 months or since the Jack Eichel trade, there haven't been any, they haven't really stepped on any piles that you can kind of, uh, point to and ask them about. I mean, but God, this goes back before Jack Eichel, though, because there was when are you going to trade Ryan O'Reilly and when are you going to trade Evander Kane and when are you going to trade all these different players that had for one reason or another weren't out there welcome or were going to be free agents and you had to get rid of them. And whether it's the coach or the general manager, there's always been somebody who either was going to be made the scapegoat or in a lot of cases, the fans have already made this person the scapegoat and the organization maybe didn't want to fire somebody, but the fans were you know, demanding a head on a stake and the team performs well enough, especially at home and in the big showcase games and towards the end of the season that fans aren't demanding a pound of flesh from any asset aspect of the franchise. There's some displeasure with ownership and the arena conditions and things like that. If you really want to dig down deep into it, but the fans seem to be satisfied with the way this season went and ready for another season it's somewhat the same. I, I would be curious to see how things are perceived if they have the exact same record next season or the same, you know, far out of the playoff picture, 25 points. I think they were behind in the playoff standings and whether that is as acceptable as it is right now, because is we had John Vogel on last week and the athletic fan survey, the, those fans that answered that survey seem to understand that this team is probably a year away from playoff contention. But I wonder if all of the fan base and the people calling into Talk, sports talk radio feel that way and really just if you go to games and they start losing home games that's when fans start to get upset and think they're wasting their money and wasting their time and this is a you know bad fan experience that stuff crops up when they're winning nobody really cares that your cup just you know that your cup holder broke in front of you but when they lose you're like yeah and that damn cup holder but one more point i just want to make because i wanted to make it before and i forgot just to contrast things i mean if you're looking at the points percentage the year that Darcy Regeer said the Sabres fans need to be ready for more suffering, they were 500 that year. And they had only been out of the playoffs. It was the second year in a row they had missed the playoffs. And you could see that maybe that was coming and they needed to rebuild. But that team was better than this team. And people wanted the coach and the general manager fired and all the key players traded away and blow it up and burn it down and start over. And now, you know, he would bring everybody back, every player, every prospect, every coach, general manager. Let's you know, run it back with this same team that's 25 points out of playoff contention. You know, it's always dangerous to do this, Jonah, but uh, I it's the, for the sake of this podcast. I think it's something to talk about. Um, and I'd be interested to hear uh, feedback from the listeners. Put it in the comment section uh, at uh, or I'm sure uh, I should. I'm sorry. I should say in the replies on, on Twitter when I when I tweet out the link to this. Um, you know, maybe the fans are just so tired of being upset. I mean, sometimes there's an exhaustion that comes with being pissed off all the time and let's find something to be excited about. And the comparison I'm coming up with the Ryan Fitzpatrick bills, those teams were not any good, uh, but you th remember how they came along and like, holy shit, at least these guys are fun. You have all these yeah. underachievers. You have guys like Stevie Johnson emerging and Fred Jackson and all these cult heroes, um, David Nelson and uh, Scott Chandler, and just all these guys who had been other teams had given up on, or they were late round picks, or they were rookie free agents, you know, Naaman Roosevelt and, and uh, um, uh, David John Nelson. David Nelson, I said, uh, Jones, I'm drawing a blank on Jones. Donald Jones. Donald, Donald Jones. Jones. Um, yeah, all these guys, even on the offensive line, it's like, oh my God, these guys are friggin' fun, even though they sucked, but you, <laughs> but it, you got so sick of, all right, I'm tired of just having this Dick Duran. And I think you can make the Dick Duran to Ralph Kruger line also. And then you had replaced with a guy that you could at least like people like Chan Gailey. He, he wasn't Vince Lombardi, but people are like, you know what? Chan Gailey's a straight. People like Buddy Nix too. 
Right. There's a, a straight shooter. He has some charm. You want the guy to win. You root for him. Unlike Jerron, unlike um, Greg, uh, Greg Williams, like a, a, unlike a lot of guys, unlike Doug Marone. In fact, I remember, you know, when, at the end with Doug Marone, when everybody was wiped out with him, I, I remember hearing from fans that be like, man, I wish we hadn't fired Chan Gailey. And I think that that's just reflective of, uh, of a time when I, when the bills fans were just so tired of caring so much about the playoffs that they finally just sat back and said, all right, well, we know, we know we, we still have a long way to go, but at least these guys are entertaining us on Sunday afternoons. And, and every game back then was at one o'clock on Sunday that that team wouldn't, they wouldn't last on prime time. Anyways. Um, I, I just uh, that it, that popped into my head as you were talking about Sabres fans and the excitement over a team that really isn't that good. But by contrast, you can at least be proud to wear the gear out in public. You know, you can you can put the hat on, you can put the sweatshirt on and and not feel like you're losing a piece of your soul. Right. I think the connection I would make to those Changeli teams in that season is that the expectations were lower when there are no expectations. And really you think the team's going to be bad or disappointing and then they exceed your expectations. It's more fun to be sub- surprised and, you know, take that as it comes. Then when you think the team's going to be good and they're not good, or you think the team's going to be mediocre and they are mediocre, it's kind of where you set the expectations. And I guess you can't artificially set them low every year, but it's nice as a fan and also when you're running the team and playing on the team, probably to be in a situation with no expectations, because almost anything you do is going to be positively and looked at as overachieving. And I will go with the the style of play also uh, to go from Trent Edwards, captain check down, trentative check words, all the different, you know, to, to, Ryan Fitzpatrick, where at least he'd chuck it downfield and he'd throw, you know, three interceptions, but he, he was making some daring throws while doing it. Everybody pulling in the same direction, similar to going from Ralph Kruger's system to Don Granado's system. It's not like Don Granado is, is rewriting uh, the rules for coaching uh, and the way that the NHL will be played in three years. They're not going to look back and say, well, Don Granado, uh, but in comparison to Ralph Kruger slash Dick Duran, uh, it looks like the uh, it looks like the Islanders dynasty. Um, let's talk. Let's let's shift over to the Bills and the draft. Uh, we were both out there in Orchard Park uh, for the draft picks um, again. And the re- I talked about it uh, when we had Joe Buscali on last week to preview the draft. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know these guys. Uh, I'm not going to be able to break down all the different prospects and tell you where they're going to fit. Um, clearly, uh, it's a it's a tougher road to crack the starting lineup and make an impact on a team like the Buffalo Bills are now Super Bowl contender, hell, Super Bowl favorites. Um, that somebody in the third, fourth, fifth round uh, of, of a team like that uh, is guaranteed anything. But we do know that Kair Elam, uh, who the Bills traded up to get, the last player on their board with a first-round grade at the time that uh, they were about to pick. They felt like they needed to move up a couple of spots to ensure that they get him. Um, Kair Elam's interesting. Um, and um, you know, I talked to his uh, former college coach, uh, Torian Gray. He played in the NFL for a couple of years as a safety for the Minnesota Vikings. He's been Uh, a big time college football coach for many, many years. He coached uh, in the NFL also with Washington for a couple of seasons. Uh, So he's been around and he told me he hasn't seen anything like Kair Elam when it comes to, or I I should say when it came to his readiness, when he arrived from Palm beach, Florida to Gainesville on campus as a true freshman, he was in sec shape. Normally there's an adjustment period that goes along with it. You know, uh, Hey, I didn't realize that that college football was going to be so tough. You hear about it at UB, right? You know, you talk about it to freshmen and it's even in the mid American conference. So you can imagine what they expect from you in the Southeastern conference. Uh, And he started as a true freshman. He came in and condition in sec condition. He knew the playbook quickly 
and gave himself every opportunity. He was a vocal leader as a true freshman. So Torian Gray, the comment that he said to me is he's never seen anything like it. And that is what gives him the belief that three years later, um, as he's got that much more maturity, that much more development, that much more tutelage from his NFL playing father, Abram Elam, and his NFL playing uncle, Matt Elam, um, and all the other people that they train with, Sean, Sp- uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to reach on a name and, and say the wrong one. So I'll, I'll keep, I, I won't rattle off more names because I'll, I'll misstep, but um, these guys have been working together this development. And so anyway, Torian Gray tells me that he believes Kair Elam is going to be ready to go. Maybe, you know, obviously not, not that he's going to be consistent on a game to game basis as a rookie in the national football league. Um, especially when he might be the best cornerback on the field, but yet a rookie, uh, you know, Dane Jackson and he might have to man down the fort until Tredavious White comes back, but they're going to get picked on. Uh, It'll be interesting to see, but uh, based on at least uh, some of the people I've spoken to regarding Kair Elam, uh, not only a, a good pick with a high ceiling, but a safe pick. And that's a great equation when you're talking about your first rounder. Yeah, I think you have to give Brandon Bean and the Bills the benefit of the doubt because they've drafted very well the last few years, but especially at this position, uh, combined with Sean McDermott and the defensive coaches, Leslie Frazier, and the way they scout, they seem to know exactly what they want and have a track record of identifying good players. Going back to Tredavious White, and that was before Brandon Bean was the general manager, but finding the college talent that fits their secondary and pass defense schemes and system and developing them. And whether it's Dane Jackson, Levi Wallace developed pretty well, even though he wasn't a perfect cornerback, but he seemed to get better as the years went on and was a good fill in at that position for the last four years, even down to like Cam Lewis and Teron Johnson in the slot. They've done very well developing, identifying the talent and then developing the talent in the secondary. And I think if they're willing to trade up and use a first round pick on a cornerback, you have to think that they found a guy that they like and they think is going to fit very well and develop very well. It it will be interesting how this blends with Tredavious White's injury. And, you know, I don't know if if you have to question if Tredavious White's going to be ready to play in week one, because I think from what Brandon Bean said and the nature of the injury, he's going to be back and he's going to play. But how long is it going to take him to be to look like himself again? It does seem like with those injuries, sometimes it takes two years or it might be a case where the first month or two of the season, he's still regaining his rhythm and his form and everything and confidence and belief in that knee. And that doesn't happen until the second half of the season. And will the Bills protect Jadavius White in terms of his snap count or the number of times he's in one-on-one coverage or not having help? And usually you need you want to shade your help over to help the rookie who might get picked on. And will teams pick on uh, the rookie corner or the corner coming off an injury? And then Dane Jackson, I think, is going to play a lot, but I don't know. Is he going to play instead of Tredavious White or is he going to play instead of Kyrie Elam or are they going to find ways to ha- rotate them or have more than two or three? You know, they already have a slot corner on the field. They're going to have four corners on the field sometimes when teams aren't necessarily in four wide formations. So it'll be interesting to see how that happens. But you got to think Sean McDermott, Leslie Frazier, and the program they built specifically in pass defense will figure that out as well as any coach you could ask for. Yeah, rookies uh, have to earn their keep in the Bills system, and that's something that uh, Brandon Bean went out of his way many times to mention is that Dane Jackson is not there to be beaten out. Uh, you know, he is going to try to hold on to his position, and they think a lot of him as a football player. So, uh, But first Kyrie, round pick's not a play, right? Eventually. I mean, I think that you know, you, I, and Sean McDermott has a short leash with young players on both sides of the ball. So – if he if he makes a mistake, if he gets um, you know if he gets sideways a little bit, then I think he finds himself watching you know next to uh, next to Sean on the sideline when the defense is on the field for a series or two, or or whatever. Uh, but I, I think he's definitely going to have to show consistency over time, um, which I guess is redundant. Uh, how else do you show consistency? Uh, but I don't think that he's just automatically the opening day starter. No, I don't think so either, but I do think as the season goes on, he's got to play and he's got to look like he was a good first round pick. Not Maybe not look, because not necessarily for the perception, but 
you know, if he's not playing, that's a concern. And, and it makes you wonder if they took the wrong guy or made the wrong move at that spot. So, yeah, I just think he's going to play. And it's just going to be interesting to see where he plays and how much and whether it really – you think in the long term it's Tredavious White and Kyrie Elam, two first-round picks opposite bookends of the secondary. But it'll be interesting to see how long it takes him to get there because – as we've talked about, it's not might not be the alignment on the first game of the season. Yeah, and that is a pretty juicy prospect, isn't it? To think of Kyir Elam if he evolves or develops, I should say, into a first round pick, anything like Tredavious White, to have both of those guys on the field at the same time. You're talking about uh, probably the best cornerback duo in in Bills history, um, and also. Tredavious White seems like a young player, and he is pretty young, but he's, it's been five years since they drafted him. He's on his second contract. He just got hurt. You know, I don't think he's going anywhere anytime soon, but maybe by the time Kyir Elam is up for his second contract, you might be drafting the guy to play with Tredavious White and then also the guy that replaces Tredavious White in the long run. Anybody else uh, other than uh, the player that you know I'm going to talk about? Uh, anybody else? Uh, well, let's talk about James Cook. I thought that that was a... That was an excellent pick, uh, especially uh, I had uh, on the Channel 4 mock draft, I had the Bills taking uh, Brees Hall uh, because of their need at running back because they did say at the very start of the offseason that they needed a pass-catching receiver, or I should say at least they that was on high on their wish list, by thinking that they had signed J.D. McKissick away from Washington McKissick uh, uh, goes back on the deal or I, the agent does or however you want to, whoever you want to blame in that situation uh, and decides to resign with Washington and the bills weren't able to fill that role through free agency. Uh, but when the bills drafted Kyrie Lim with the first pick, uh, they lost the opportunity to get Brees Hall. He ends up going to the jets in the second round jets, by the way, had a fantastic draft Um Quick aside, you know, Joe Douglas, the general manager of the Jets and his scouting department, if they are worth anything, they got their first or second rated cornerback off the board with Ahmad Gardner. They got their first or second rated wide receiver in the entire draft out of Garrett Wilson. They're able to trade back into the first round to get Jermaine Johnson, who a lot of people thought was a surefire top 10 pick. He slid into the 20s, and the Jets are able to snag him as an edge rusher. And then they get the best running back on the board and uh, in Brees Hall. So filling a lot of needs. It's a, I, I thought it was an impressive draft for, uh, for Joe Douglas. But um, back to James Cook, uh, Dalvin Cook's brother. Always dangerous to read into that when you hear about brothers, you know, or the bloodlines automatically just saying, well, well, look out, carbon copy coming. Uh, that's not the case. But uh, James Cook catches the ball out of the backfield, has a lot of production in that role. Um, he's just, he's a legitimate, he's a legitimate uh, addition right there with the pick uh, with number 63. And uh, anyway, I don't know if you have anything you want to say about that, Jonah, before we move on. But uh, I, I just like, I think much, quite much, a bit. Needed, much needed speed for the offense. As good as the wide receivers are, other than Isaiah McKenzie, they don't have a lot of that breakaway speed, and especially don't have it from the running backs. So that's a good addition. I do wonder really how much he's going to get on the field and how much he's going to supplant Singletary and Moss back there if they're both still on the team. Uh, maybe he's a guy that emerges later in the season or in a future season more than we see him right away. And with the bloodline things, because this also applies to Kair Elam, I think that's a good thing. So it, maybe it's dangerous to compare – Especially James Cook. Oh, it's a, it's a good Cook. thing in terms of, yeah, getting ready to play the game and all that and having your eyes wide open and preparation and all that stuff. Right, the sure. mental I, I mean, for the fans, that. you know, it's, it's, it's not a good thing for the fans to really harp on that was what was my point. Right. Yeah. Well, then you made my point there. <laughs> I think it's good from a mental standpoint in the meeting room and for guys being ready to be professionals if they have an older brother or father or an uncle or somebody that, can guide them in that sense and how to be an NFL player and skill sets and talents don't always pass down from generation to generation or, you know, James Cook and Delvin Cook are two completely different running backs. They're running styles and their bodies and their builds and things like that. So not, he's not going to be Delvin Cook, but having a brother who's a successful NFL running back 
portends well for him being not a bust, I think. Right. I agree. It makes for a much safer pick. Uh, seems to have a head screwed on straight. Um, Khalil, Sha- Khalil Shakir uh, out of uh, Boise State. Um, just real quick, I want to mention, because I think that especially when you get on day three, fans have a tendency to drift away their attention. It, it's, uh, it's a Saturday afternoon. Maybe you got other things going on. Maybe you're starting to do your yard work. Uh, you're getting into other things. Maybe your kid's uh, baseball game. Um, but uh, Khalil Shakir, uh, wide receiver, but he's a gadget guy. A lot of people uh, like to say he's Debo Samuel Light. Again, dangerous comparison, but it gives an idea of how people view him. Uh, he caught 77 passes last year um, for 1,100 yards and seven touchdowns. He also ran 21 times for 130 yards. And in fact, over the course of his career, he rushed about 20 times a season. Mm-hmm. Uh, in all four se- in all four uh, years of his college career, three rushing touchdowns on 19 attempts in 2019, while also catching 63 passes. Um, he also is a kick returner and a punt returner. Now he didn't do it extensively, but he did have experience doing that uh, with uh, with Boise State. It'll be interesting to see if the Bills maybe want to try him out there. They have been frustrated with their kick and punt return guys uh, since Andre Roberts left. Uh, oh, oh, by the way, um, Khalil Shakir can throw it a, a little bit. Uh, he, uh, he's uh, four of five as a college passer uh, for a touchdown, also an interception. But he's just one of those guys that when he, you know, we were talking about it the other day, Jonah, you know, how uh, you have a guy um, in today's NFL draft, maybe his, his report on uh, over the weekend would just say offensive line. Uh, because of there's some versatility. They don't want to peg the guy as a center or, a, or as a guard or, or a tackle. Uh, and this would be the guy who shows up on campus out of high school and his position is athlete. Yeah, I wondered, I don't know, did he play high school quarterback? Because usually that's a quarterback. They're switching to another position. But yeah, he does have positional versatility he had in college and seems like he'll bring that to the Bills. Um, in In a lot of those ways, whether they use them in different gadget Debo Samuel type ways, or if he's just playing slot receiver, it seems like he has run after the catch ability and not that the bills don't have guys with run after the catch ability on the roster right now, but they didn't do a good job of that last year. And it does seem like they needed to add more of that to the offense. And maybe there's different ways Josh Allen can help his receivers get more yards after catch. But I think Brandon Bean mentioned it in his press conference when they drafted James cook, that that was something they wanted to add to the roster. And I think Khalil Shakir, when he gets on the field, will be able to do that. I do wonder where he fits on the depth chart right now and whose spot at wide receiver does he maybe take? And does Jamison Crowder block him from being the slot receiver? And if he's the fourth receiver, what about Isaiah McKenzie? What about Marquez Stevenson? Same thing with the kick returning. And maybe he beats somebody out, Stevenson, perhaps for the roster spot and the kick return job and all of that stuff. But this is one reason why I wasn't so sure they were going to take a wide receiver in the first round like a lot of people wanted them to, because you just wonder who they're going to cut to bring in this rookie wide receiver. Yeah, you want the depth. That sounds great. But yeah, there's not a lot of room at the end. And it's kind of brings us back full circle to what we were talking about at the beginning is it's tough to make this team, especially as a day three draft pick. And that leads us right into pick number 180. Uh, Early in the sixth round, Matt Areza, the punter out of San Diego State, uh, punt god, as he's known. Uh, Huge leg, of course. You don't get the nickname punt god if you don't have a big leg. But there are a lot of guys with who can kick it far that don't stick in the NFL because they can't kick it with some art. Uh, You need to be a little bit of an artiste when it comes to this to be able to get the backspin on your kicks, to be able to angle it out of bounds to be able to not kick it so far that your gunners can't get down towards the goal line and defend it uh, from a touchback. So he's got a lot to learn. He's only been punting for one season. I made the point on Twitter, and this is the reason I want to bring it up, Jonah, is, okay, big leg, uh, makes you drool. Um, Corey Bogharka has had a really big leg, and he couldn't stick. In fact, he's on his fourth team now in, in two years. Uh, he, he went out west and got traded to Green Bay, and then he got cut. And it's because he has trouble holding. Uh, If you can't be a reliable holder in the NFL, then your value as a punter 
diminishes significantly. Your spot on the roster is not nearly as important. It's a point that I made on Twitter, and this isn't a humble brag because uh, hopefully I'll be talking to this guy for a story, but um, a lot of fans on Twitter went after me as an idiot because there's no way you draft a punter unless he's lock, a lock for the team. Well, that's horseshit because the Bills have drafted guys in the sixth round each of the last two years who didn't make the team. Uh, Isaiah Hodgins and Richard Wild Goose. Each was cut uh, before playing in the NFL. Uh, Wild Goose for another team. So um, I just want to set that aside. You do, <laughs> sixth round picks are not precious commodities. Um, and then the idea of holding. Well, people are saying, well, Barkley can hold. All right. Well, so you're dressing a third quarterback on Sundays or your, your quarterback who's not as good. Uh, as your as your number two, just to hold. Well, who's who doesn't get a uniform that day then? Uh, and let's also uh, put that to rest because quarterbacks just don't hold anymore. That's uh, that's from the 1980s, the 1990s. I guess Tony Romo did it and failed, and that's probably the last of that. But because of the way the CBA works, and because of practice rules and the, the amount of time players are allowed to be on the field and actively working out, you need to maximize the time for your quarterbacks to be with the quarterbacks. You want Matt Barkley to get it. You want Matt Barkley getting Josh Allen as prepared for the next game as you want, whether it be running the scout team or whether it be standing in the huddle, helping him out uh, at, at practice every day. And that's why the punter is a holder in the NFL these days. Because those people are off working together and punter, maximize your time and hold, hold the ball for this guy. So uh, Jay Feely reaches out. He's the former NFL kicker. Did a little punting too. Uh, but uh, former kicker who's now an analyst with CBS Sports on Twitter to say, Tim's right. And then some people started arguing with Jay Feely that he didn't know what he was talking about. So uh, if he can't hold, he doesn't make the roster. Well, and... Matt Hawk is Brandon Bean described him as an elite holder. You maybe call him holder God. So right. So good. In fact, that they couldn't cut him despite the fact that he, he was terrible as a punter last year, right? They hadn't, they had no other option. They didn't. That's how important not disrupting Tyler Bass's process is to the bills. It was more important than the position of punter period. Right. And this is a team that will be kicking more than it will be punting or at least when it's playing well, you know, they, they didn't punt at all in a few regular season games and the playoff win over New England. And also I think the ideal situation for Buffalo is probably that even though he may be a waste of six round pick that this punter comes in and maybe it pushes Matt Hawk to be the punter that they need him to be it from a reliability standpoint. He's not going to have as big of a leg, but that's not really what it's all about. It's about putting the ball where, the special teams coach and the team wants the ball to be punted to and then doing, doing your job and what's expected of you and holding is part of that too, because you never come off the field and say, wow, that was a great hold. But if it's a bad hold and they missed the kick, that's pretty obvious. And the same thing with punting. So if this pushes Matt Hawk to be a better punter, uh, that's probably maybe worth the draft pick and maybe bringing somebody in. And the really ideal scenario would be if somehow, so it might be good for the bills. If Matt Areza is, dropping field goal snaps and screwing up and kicking the ball far, but not being able to kick it high. Cause I think that's something he's still developing the hang time on his punts to the point where the bills can keep him on the practice squad and develop him for a season. And maybe if he can, cause we don't know if he's a bad holder, he's just an inexperienced holder. So maybe he needs a, a season of practicing being a holder and practicing doing the things as a punter that he's not capable of and harnessing the power of his leg. And if the Bills can somehow, because you're not going to keep two punters on the active roster, but if the Bills can somehow keep both. Well, wait a minute. Remember when teams here. used to keep two kickers? They'd have the field goal guy and the kickoff right. specialist. Mean, so the Bills maybe could do that if they needed a kickoff specialist, but Tyler Bass is a strong-legged kicker. So I don't think it makes sense to keep a kickoff specialist back. No, I'm saying that you maybe you have a punter. You have a punt. You have your punter and your hold specialist. Yeah, holder specialist, maybe. Well, oh, one other right. nuance, uh, too. Wouldn't that to be the, a ridiculous use of it, a roster? Spot? Yes, it would be. That's yeah. what's the point I'm making. I'm, I'm saying it tongue-in-cheek, but hell, if it's that important. Um, I also uh, One more little bit of nuance regarding why backup quarterbacks don't hold anymore, everywhere except Madden. For whatever reason, Madden still has your backup quarterback as your holder. 
uh, if Madden wants to be realistic, you got to put those punters in there. Uh, but um, I don't know. A lot of, I know what your point is. You're saying that no, nobody uses a quarterback as a holder anymore. And there's reasons why. But I just want to add one more reason why before you say that it's because a lot of teams have only two quarterbacks. Now it's not even like it's a depth position where you have a third quarterback who's got nothing to do. Right. You're not, you're, you're, if you have two quarterbacks on your roster, they're both busy throughout the week. You want them in training camp in the meeting room and working. You want Josh Allen working with these guys. You want all uh, everybody helping out this offense. You don't need to go send your backup quarterback off for half the practice in the summer at St. John Fisher to go hold for field goals. All right. I'm sorry. You were saying you're right. Yeah, I guess so. I just think it could be done. You would have to have a guy who was good at it enough and reliable enough that he can be your holder without practicing holding quite as much as you need him to. And it's a risk because of the chemistry factor. And Tyler Bass was a better kicker with a better holder than he was with Corey Bajorquez. So I don't know if it makes sense for the bills to do that right now. But if you had a veteran quarterback who had held before, really knew what he was doing, it was like, we just need you to do this on Sundays. I don't think it's out of the question that an NFL team could try that or that the league could trend back towards using different players as holders. I mean, I always wonder why you don't use a wide receiver, because if you need good hands, you would think those are the best guys on the team or a tight end. I think the Bills used Scott Chandler as a holder years ago. So you The Steelers, Chuck like Knoll that. used to use a safety. I, I, I think I recalled um... – Rod Woodson even holding uh, for a little while. Uh, but yeah, they had, uh, they've always used defensive backs. Tony Dungy, I think was a holder uh, for Chuck Knoll, you know, stuff like, of course, Tony Dungy used to play quarterback, but. Um, Matt or Reza, though, I don't, I don't know if the bills are going to give him this opportunity and they definitely won't right away early on, but he wants to kick field goals and punt in the NFL, which somebody hasn't done in very many years. And all right. So that's the same reasons you're talking about with the holder. It might never happen. It seems like it's out of right. Who's going to hold, who's going to hold for him. (laughs) He's going to have to to hold for himself. I mean, look, Jonah, you and I can be our own holders uh, in the comfort of our own home. Uh, But uh, out on the football field, you can't be your own holder. Um, the other thing I was just going to mention regarding, uh, the holds in the NFL, uh, J- uh, Jay Feely and I have talked about this for years. I covered him. Uh, my first job in the NFL was covering the 2007 Miami dolphins. He was the kicker on that team. And, uh, we used to have talks all the time about nuances and, but the little, the granular things, uh, within the NFL. And I recall a discussion that we had many years ago in which he was saying a little bit of a conspiratorial theory. Uh, types thing, but he, he, he was just as a thought exercise, we were talking about, he was saying about how a, a holder could cost a kicker the job. Like he could swing the competition. If there's a kicking competition going on in training camp, the holder, if he wanted to, could totally screw one of the guys by doing things that aren't even noticeable with the naked eye or film or anything. It's all so subtle on all the little things that happen on a hold. So, uh, and it made me think of this when you mentioned it's obvious when there's a bad hold, Jay Feely would contend. Absolutely not. In fact, most of the bad holds, you'd have no idea. You would look at it and say, man, the kicker just fucked that up. You know, the kicker, he, he missed not necessarily. That's why you look back on some of those holds with Corey Bohorquez and, and you don't necessarily see like, Did Mason Crosby just get the yips? Did one of the greatest kickers in NFL history all of a sudden get to a point where he can't make a field goal? No, it might have been the guy who's had trouble holding at every one of his stops, um, even though we can't necessarily see it with the naked eye. But that's just a a fun little thing. Uh, Jonah, I I know you got to get. Some would argue that the Bills lost Super Bowl 25 because of the holder. Or the hold on the kick is possibly why the kick didn't go in. This is also the plot of Ace Ventura. But Frank Reich, who was the best quarterback in franchise history, and I, I would believe was a reliable holder at that time. Did you just call him the it. best quarterback in franchise history? Best backup quarterback. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, Other than Ryan Fitzpatrick. Sure. Well, Ryan Fitzpatrick was the starter, though. I, but, anyways, uh, you know, I mean, he came in as the backup. I was just making jokes. But there's a history of overlooking the importance of the hold and, and you think a kick was missed and a, an important kick was missed and the holder being unreliable is the reason that happened. Right. Uh, I think that uh, if Tyler Bass is not comfortable with Matt Areza, Matt Areza is not making the team. I don't care whether he was the 180th overall pick or the 
80th overall pick. Uh, they, the bills will not make it work just because they won't keep them around just to save face on a draft pick. Well, they're they not need to keep them around they need just to make kick, their fucking field goals, just to kick 80 yard punts because the offense is probably good enough that they're not going to be in that situation too often. Yeah. How often are the bills going to be so backed up? They have a good defense, you know, even if they are backed. Yeah. I mean, come on. Um, and that's to say that he's going to automatically be good at, at the punting part too. He could drive everybody nuts with his inability to, you know, get the ball to not go through the back of the end zone. Well, he was so. the third punter taken. And interestingly enough, I'm forgetting the punter's name, but Stout. The Ravens took a punter with the pick that the Bills traded the Ravens to move up uh, for James Cook. Or, Anyways, the, the, the fourth round pick that the Bills traded away, the Kyrie Elam trade. That went to a punter that was taken two rounds before the Bills took their punter. So he's not yeah. even the best punter in the draft. Fascinating. But Punt God is a fun nickname. He's However, I'm just I'm I'm warning Bills fans just because he has a fun nickname doesn't mean you have to uh you know go caping for this guy to make the roster. That's uh, uh it's not that important. It's not that much fun. It does it's not gonna add that much more entertainment to your to your game day experience that you can call the guy punt god. And then you're holding your breath when Tyler Bass lines up for a 40 yarder. I do think we need to shout out Joe Biscelli and how excited he was for this pick before it even happened. Yeah. And him yeah. maybe being kind of right with calling the pick and how people were congratulating Joe when the Bills drafted a punter. And <laughs> they were. he's most excited. It isn't that they took the punter that can kick it 100 yards or whatever. He just likes that the, his name's Matt and that it's the same first name as the punter that they have. And there's going to be a Matt versus Matt punter competition. And that doesn't happen if they take a different punter. That's right. It was a big day for Joe uh, in many ways. Uh, check out Joe's coverage um, by all means. You want to get uh, way more into depth as to what these picks mean, how they project. Uh, check out Joe Biscalia's coverage at The Athletic. Uh, don't rely on us. Uh, but we did have uh, strong thoughts and insights uh, regarding. And a little, Oh, by the way, in that thread, it should be mentioned, a little news, I guess, was broken. So Jay Feely uh, says, you know, Tim's right. If he can't hold, he doesn't make the team. And a few minutes later, Seattle Seahawks kicker Jason Myers responds in the thread to say, I've been working out with Matt uh, and he's doing a great job. So an adult conversation, nobody was sniping. And Jay said, responded to say, that's good to hear uh, because it's going to be a big thing. You know, he's, he, he didn't hold last year. He's been the field goal kicker and he just started punting. And so he hasn't held in the game yet because he was also the kicker. Um, Jonah, thanks for this. I know you got to get moving, uh, but uh, thanks for lending your, your thoughts here. Uh, let me also just remind uh, people to uh, keep Amherst pizza and ale house in mind when you're considering your dining and uh, drinking needs. You can watch all the college and pro action, uh, the hockey playoffs, the basketball playoffs, uh, so much baseball going on in the afternoon. You can make it an all-day affair pretty much any day of the week uh, at Amherst Pizza and Ale House. 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville. That's right off of Millersport Highway in the 990. Amherst Pizza and Ale House has uh, TVs inside and outside. So as the weather's getting nice here, you want to uh, go have a few beers outside, watch some sports, bet on the games, whatever it is that you do. Uh, they're going to have everything that is possible to have on the air. Uh, you're going to be able to find it on one of the TVs. And quite frankly, you can just say, hey, can I get such and such on this TV? And within a minute, there it is. Recognized by ESPN.com as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. A lot of energy. It's where Jonah and I like to go when we have the ability. Stop in for uh, takeout and delivery. 716-625-7100. One more time. 716-625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. Jonah, thanks again. Uh, we'll do it later on in this in uh, this week with a Kentucky Derby preview with our own uh, Gene Kirshner of CTBK, who also happens to cover horse racing for the Buffalo News. Uh, he's going to drop in and give us his thoughts on this year's uh, Run for the Roses. Uh, until then, uh, thanks for listening to Tim Graham and Friends, brought to you by CTBK. CTBK is more than just a full-service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem-solving skills. 
CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. We'll